Good morning. Welcome to worship. Please sign in on the pads in front of you as we go through the announcements. That is a great help to us, and I promise we don't send junk mail. Three things I want to call your attention to in the bulletins so you can look at what I'm talking about. The first is that Sean, Rogers, and Jenny are putting on a Bible study based on Handel's Messiah. This is going to be different from most Bible studies I've ever been a part of. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and really exciting. It's going to incorporate music, and we're going to explore the themes of Scripture that are reflected in Handel's Messiah, and Sean will be leading that. And so, Jenny, that's going to be a lot of fun. That's coming up, so I encourage you to attend that, hold those spaces open on your calendars, and take this flyer home that's in your bulletins. Number two... Thanksgiving is coming, and our church traditionally has a Thanksgiving meal, and we will do that next Sunday after worship. There's a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Please sign up for what you can bring to our Thanksgiving church meal. We ask that it be as table-ready as possible when you bring it, uh, and then the team that's leading it up, we can fill in those gaps, but we need to know what you can bring so that the team can know what they need to do. Lastly, Christmas is also coming, and we'd like you, if you're able and interested, to reserve um, December 2nd, that's a Saturday, for decorating the church for Christmas. That could be a lot of fun if you're into decorating. We'll meet at 10 a.m. and should be finished by noon. So that's the last announcement there in your bulletins. Please help us with the decorating. With that, let's stand and greet each other with a friendly welcome. Good morning. Will you please rise and join me in the call to worship? Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou font of life, thou light of all. From the best place of earth and hearts, we turn unfilled to thee. 
Thy truth unchanged hath ever stood. Thou savest those that on you call. Please be seated. Well, while they are getting the opening video, let's stand and sing. Oh, you know what? We can't do that either because that's on the... Let's just go to the let's just go to the hymn then in the PowerPoint. Yes. There we are. Let us stand if you are able. precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of
may be seated and let's have the children come forward. Well, good morning. How, how are all of you today? Do you know that we had a holiday maybe just two days ago? Do you know what holiday it was? Veterans Day. That's right, Colton. It was Veterans Day a couple days ago. And I have here something that makes me think about Veterans Day. Can you all see that picture? It's an airplane. It is. It is a U.S. airplane. I think it's Air Force, though. And did you know that we have an Air Force base just down the road? And that there's a museum in Boise that commemorates airplanes and all sorts of different they artifacts have an airplane from. Air show? Well, they do have an air show. Have you seen that? Yeah. It's pretty cool, huh? Would, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to talk with you about something. Um, the people who serve in our military, one of the things they do is they protect our freedom to worship God. Did you know that? that they defend our freedom to do all sorts of things, but one of them is to worship God. And so it's right that in church we are appreciative that those veterans serve to not only keep us safe, but to allow us to be here to worship God. Can we say a prayer and thank God for those veterans? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have the, we have the freedom. Okay. We have the freedom to worship you. And we thank you for all those who selflessly give their time and risk their lives to not just keep us safe, but to allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth as you call us to. Lord, we thank you for each and every veteran, especially those who are here among us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here to tell you about the thank offering. It started in 1889, but today it's a church-wide offering. This year we have 15 projects, 10 are in the United States, and 5 are overseas. The theme this year is for the healing of the nations, and it's taken from Revelations 22. When the North and South reunited in 1988, the thank offering took a big leap forward. $25 million has been received since that date and over 2,000 projects, and two of them have been in this county. You will see a poster in the back and you'll see a list of the projects on the bulletin board in the social hall. The projects include health, education, opportunities to improve living conditions for many. And if you decide to participate, you have a blue envelope. I hope you'll want to use it. If you're writing a check, please put Presbyterian Women Thank Offering on it. It makes it easier for our treasurers. Our gifts are going to be dedicated at the Christmas tea which is December 9th. Along with this offering, there's a hymn that is based on it. The first verse is called For the Healing of the Nations. For the healing of the nations, Lord, we pray with one accord for a just and equal sharing of the things that earth affords to a life of love and action Help us rise and pledge our word. The verses that follow tell of the different ways that we can assist God in making this world truly a place of peace instead of war. 
I hope you'll want to participate in this. And you have a blue envelope, as I reminded you. Thank you very much. Hear the call to confession. God allows no one to boast in their own righteousness. God cuts down the proud and exalts the humble. Therefore, we humbly confess our sins, trusting the mercy of God. O oh God, we know, we know our own, own weakness. Our, our minds are, are darkened, and by, and by ourselves, ourselves we cannot find and know the truth. truth. Our wills are weak, and that which we temptation or bring it to completion that which we resolve to do. Our hearts are fickle, and by ourselves we cannot give to you the loyalty which is your due. Our steps are faltering, and by ourselves we cannot walk in your straight way. So this day we ask you to enlighten us, to strengthen us, to guide us, and to forgive us. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated.
Please join me in a time of prayer, and we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the world you created. Thank you for your word that you've spoken to us throughout the ages, through the prophets, through the law, and finally, and most perfectly, through your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we gather and worship. It's through him that we have access to you, God. And it's through him that we have forgiveness and eternal life. We thank you that we can come together and worship you. And we're thankful, Lord, this morning for those veterans who give of themselves their time and risk their very lives to keep us safe, to protect our freedoms. Lord, our country was founded on the principle of religious freedom. Those who came here came here to worship you freely according to their choices, according to their convictions and their consciences. Lord, we pray that we might continue to honor their memory, to honor those veterans who serve us and still protect us. Lord, we are grateful for them. We're grateful that you raise them up, that you give them courage and strength to do their work. We pray that you bless all those who are currently serving. We pray, Lord, especially for those who return and find it difficult, Lord, to adjust after having served. Lord, we know from the news that there are many veterans who struggle with health issues, both physical and mental. Lord, we pray for all of them. We pray for healing. We pray for blessing. Lord, we are grateful for this chance to offer prayers up to you, and we lift up the praises and prayers of our friends and neighbors. Lord, we pray for Sarita Coons and her husband and her, their sons. Sarita passed away on Wednesday after many years of Alzheimer's. We thank you for her life and for her faith and pray that you would comfort her family as they grieve her loss. Lord, we lift up all those things that each and every one of us brought in here with us, all of our fears, our concerns, and our praises. We lift them up to you, and we pray as your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us, let us stand, if you are able, and sing, For freedom Christ has set us free. Again, stand, if you are able.
I'm just curious, before I start, I'd like to know, I think I know that we have some veterans in here, but I'd like to invite those who are veterans, those who've served in our military to please stand. And I just want to give you a round of applause. Thank you. It's true that most, most of us, most Americans, we don't know a whole lot about maybe what, what veterans have done or do in their service. Um, and it's good that we learn. But what we do know is that you put yourselves in between us and people who'd like to hurt us. And we should all be grateful for that. We are working our way this month through the theme of the Reformation because, as you know, as I've said before, it's been 500 years this year since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. 500 years. That's a long time. And we're here because of what Luther did. One of the things he did was to set us free from the tyranny of piety, piety being the outward form of religious devotion and being addicted to that, being dependent on that to build ourselves up and to have our self-confidence. Luther, he either set us free from it or he took it away from it, from us, depending on how you look at it. But he humbled us. He made us dependent on grace. But the good news is he set us free from the tyranny of piety. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And our scripture comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Listen for the word of the Lord. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law, have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. You were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. I am confident about you in the Lord that you will not think otherwise. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. But my friends, why am I still being persecuted if I am still preaching circumcision? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. That's got to be one of my top ten favorite verses. <laughs> For you, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Paul is angry. You were called to freedom, he's saying. To grace, not to be bound by the law. But you were called to freedom. Brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of the Lord. So circumcision. I have two jokes that are my favorite jokes about circumcision that I'm going to indulge in. Two men were sitting in a hospital one asked the other, what are you in for? And he said, circumcision. And so the first man said, oh, circumcision. They did that to me when I was born and I couldn't walk for a year. <laughs> the, uh, the emperor of Japan was looking for a bodyguard and three men applied to be the bodyguard of the emperor. Uh, a Chinese man, a Japanese man, and a Jewish man. So the emperor gave a test this, the emperor said, you have to cut a fly in two with your sword. So the Chinese man stood up. The fly was buzzing around. And in one swoop, he chopped the fly in two. Then the Japanese man stood up and had a, had a fly in the room. It was buzzing around. He swung at it twice. The fly dropped to the floor, cut into four pieces. The Jewish man stood up. He chased the fly around the room and swung at it three, four, five times, and then sat back down 
with the fly still buzzing around his head. And the emperor said, well, what are you doing? You haven't killed the fly. It's still alive. And the Jewish man said, yes, but now he's circumcised. <laughs> but circumcision, in all seriousness, was not a joke to the people Paul was writing to. Circumcision wasn't just a one-time ritual that happened in the past that no longer mattered. It stood for the identity of God's people. If you were circumcised, that meant you belonged to God. It meant you, that you were a good religious person. And it stood for all of the things that you had to do in obedience to God. It stood for obedience. And obedience is a good thing, right? So what I want to do this morning is, is not just to look at circumcision, but to think of circumcision rather in modern terms. In other words, what is it today? What are the outward, external shows of piety that we feel like make us good people, that we rely on for our identity? Circumcision really stands for this outward piety. What do we do that would fall under that category today? And what does Paul mean by the new creation? It almost seems as if on the one hand there is a false piety. There are external things that we should put no pride in. But there's also a new creation. There's a genuine form of piety. True and false piety. The dictionary says piety means an outward action or display of religious devotion. And what are the things that we do? How is it that we are caught up in this idea of circumcision that seems ancient, but maybe, maybe it's still alive today in new forms? What is false piety? And the next slide. I'm going to argue that false piety has two marks, two ways we can recognize it. And the first is that it makes mountains out of molehills. Piety takes small superficial things and makes a big deal out of them while it neglects, as Jesus said, the weightier matters of the law. A good illustration of false piety came in something that Tony Campolo said. And here's a warning. I'm going to say a curse word in church. So if there's anyone you don't want to hear that curse word, this is your fair warning. And I, I'm going to say it because Tony Campolo said it, and it illustrates false piety. And Tony Campolo, if you don't know, is a, a Baptist pastor and professor. He's also one of the world's foremost authorities on youth ministry. Uh, he, he was the authority in youth ministry for 40 years. And this is what he said as he spoke to a large convention of youth workers and youth pastors. I'm going to read his quote directly. He said this, I have three things I'd like to say today. First, while you were sleeping last night, 30,000 kids died of starvation or diseases related to malnutrition. Second, most of you don't give a shit. What's worse is that you're more upset with the fact that I said shit than the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. Now, I'm no different than the people in that room. When I first heard that, I was more shocked by the curse word than the number of children. But that's what false piety is. False piety is that thing, whatever it is in us, that gets more upset about a dirty word than about the real suffering that's going on in the world. That's what false piety is. It makes mountains out of molehills. It takes the little things too seriously, and it takes the big things not seriously enough. And there's false piety in me. I grew up in, in a Christian church where a big deal was made out of the kind of music you listened to, the kind of things that you didn't do. And for a long time, I thought that Christianity was a list of vices that you were supposed to avoid. That's false piety. But luckily, I had teachers similar to Tony Campolo who taught me that Christianity isn't about these superficial things. It's about knowing and trusting that Jesus died on the cross 
that you need him and that you have to give your life in service to him to love others. The second mark of false piety is that it's, it's self-centered. It, it's really in the end about us. Either building ourselves up for our own sake to feel good about ourselves or is to look good for others. When I was in college, I was part of a prayer group, a college ministry prayer group. We met every week to pray about, about everything for each other and for the things that were going on in the world. And these prayer meetings, they started out lasting about an hour. And then they were an hour and a half. And then they started lasting two and three hours. And I realized that what was happening as we sat around these young college students praying, we were starting to try to impress each other with how spiritual we were, with how passionate we could pray. And the idea was, although we didn't think it consciously or say it out loud, that the more we loved God, the longer we would pray. And these prayers then were no longer really about God or each other. They were about making us feel religious and spiritual, making us look good to one another. And that's false piety. False piety makes big things 